formal subsumption, Fordism, real subsumption, early cognitive capitalism, neural materialism, body without organs, regimes of truth, brain without organs, neuro power. Before going on and, and discussing uh, the terms that were just given, I want to give a couple more uh, general comments about the sculpture uh, or the neon. And very important to understand is that in many ways this neon represents the culmination of two different lifestyles and two different, um, uh, different kinds of situations that I've been making work in. I've been living between Berlin and Los Angeles and I think in, in, in in this neon, both express themselves. So for instance, uh, as far as Los Angeles goes, uh, the incredible neon that one sees along um, Sunset Strip, there's a neon museum here. But more importantly, from an art historical point of view, we have the light and uh, space movement, which used uh, neon in their work and used fluorescent tubes, was concer concerned with light and had this kind of hyper finish to the work that they made. And I think you see that here, as well as, uh, importantly, as the work uh, from Berlin, which my work has been very much affected by. And most importantly, the, um, this, this, exib this artwork by Joseph uh, Beuys called Das Kapital Raum, which is at the B Hamburger Bahnhof, and to which I brought my students every week a different group of them uh, to view it from the Weisensee Kunsthochschule. I would bring them on Wednesdays, different groups, uh, to, to, to see the piece and to discuss the piece. So, and, and you see that here. Now in the, the original piece, the original work at L40 at uh, the Kunstverein Rosa Luxemburg Platz, I actually mounted 24 blackboards uh, which uh, reiterated those blackboards that that the Das Kapital Raum uh, display. So in other words, Das Kapital Raum were, uh, uh, was a kind of a history of pedagogy between 1970 and 1977 that boys did, and they represented uh, traces of different lectures that he made. Uh, and then uh, the piece is a kind of um, phylogeny of those, uh, of, those, of, of those lectures. And then you also you see uh, a lot of artifacts that he used in the performances that were part of those lectures. Um, and so that, that kind of work and the, and the work of Anna Imhoff as well had a lot to do with the, uh, with the way that this piece came together. Now, uh, I'm also uh, have uh, you know been very involved in what's called cognitive capitalism, and I I organized actually the first cognitive ca capitalism symposium with Arne de Bavor uh, from CalArts, and we did it at the Hollywood uh, Library. We did the first one, uh, and then I did two other uh, books on cognitive capitalism, and just wrote a book called the um, the glossary of cognitive activism, in which all of these works, all these words are uh, found in. But getting back to here, uh, importantly, uh, you have to understand again that everything is connected. So when, when, when I was talking before about uh, artificial intelligence, the distribution of the sensible, the internet of everything, art, uh, uh, algorithms, um, the, the thing that I didn't mention when I was talking about those that is important for what we just talked about, neural materialism, neural power, co early cognitive capitalism, and late cognitive capitalism, is these terms called epigenesis and neuroplasticity. The neuroplasticity of the brain is the cap capacity of the brain to change. Um, and there are, what, during critical periods, there are, is are a blooming of neural elements, which is, which is heterochronous, meaning that the DNA of the gene is timed in a certain way that a, at a certain moment in a certain part of the brain, uh, there's a, a, a kind of a, an awakening, so to speak, uh, and an overgrowth of, of, of neurons with varying capabilities. This, this is where neural diversity comes from and variation comes from. Neural diversity, very important issue today. Uh, we want to increase and embrace neural diversity. Um, you know, the neural diversity of the, the, of the child 
child with a, attention deficit disorder or on the continuum of the autistic, autistic spectrum. These represent different kinds of neural, uh, of, of, of neural diversity that we, we need to maintain and we, we want to expand. We, want, we, don't, there, we don't want that diversity like the diversity of nature. We don't want to homogenize it. We don't want to politi politicize it. And one of the keys uh, of this neuroplasticity, this ability to change, is that I'm arguing that art has the power, the capacity, through creating differences in the cultural environment, in the cultural milieu, and that technology also, through its, in, 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 um, through its relationship um, uh, to the extracranial brain and its, and, and its importance in the intracranial brain, that these kinds of variation, variability, uh, have a lot of effect. Now, very important in this respect is the work of Bernard Stiegler and the idea of accelerated technology. So we, we've been through, part of the upper left-hand corner is really about the accelerated technologies that have occurred. And when we take this idea of epigenesis, we have to think about uh, Stiegler's term epiphylogenesis. Well, ep epiphylogenesis was a term that he made up, uh, that he coined, to express the phylogeny of technologies, the technologies, the phylogenesis of technologies. And each technology, he, he argued, uh, was exteriorized. It was exterior, the process of exteriorization. And what that process of exteriorization means is that the material brain comes out to, be, to gather and to, um, to grasp and embrace those technologies. And those technologies have an effect on the brain. Now, what he did is he looked at the, the, the work of Lois Goron. And Lois Goron was a famous uh, 20th century anthropologist and theorist who understood uh, this very, um, this very uh, intimate relationship. And what happened is that if you look two million years ago uh, to the beginning of man, to Homo habilis, and you move through uh, all the way to hum Homo erectus, you see that there's an expansion of the brain, especially the, for the forebrain, um, and, but also the temporal lobes and the parietal cortex. And in each case, if you look at the endocasts of these particular um, human, humanoid species, as they, as they move, as they come up to Neanderthal and Cro-Magna, as you look at their endocast, you see the shape of the brain. And the shape of the brain gets larger and expands. So this, this is the key to this idea of epiphylogenesis, because fire, um, by fl uh, flaking uh, particular types of spears, the old vice spear, uh, burying your, your dead and ornamenting them with all kinds of objects. The, all these, the, the social intensity of migration that took place in, the early, in, in these early times, each time there was one of these kinds of events, these crises, these crises, um, what happened was a, 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 a co-evolution took place, a, um, a co uh, a, 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 a dematerialization and a, and, a, and a materialization took place in these two systems contiguously. So that's, that's very important for us to understand. So that process is still going on today. That process is still going on today. And the, the relationship between epigenesis, about how the environment changes, and as I said, not only the environment, but the environment of tool use and culture and art objects and all these things, and how it affects the neuroplasticity is key to understanding what is called the late stage of cognitive capitalism. There's an early stage of cognitive capitalism and a late stage. And the early cognitive capital, uh, stage of cognitive capitalism erupts out of Fordism and post-Fordism. And key, I can't go into it all in detail, time does not allow for this, but just to say that uh, the formal subsumption of the worker working in the factory becomes the performative and real subsumption of the cognitariate in which everything is work. And then, I'm not here, but in other writings that I've written about, you get neural subsumption. And the neural subsumption is a product of neural power in which everything we think, conscious and unconscious, becomes work. But we need new technologies that are right on the, on the horizon. You've heard of Elon Musk's neural link, linking the brain through brain-computer interfaces to the internet and to the artificial intelligences. This is the beginning of these new tools 
uh, whereby uh, an individual can use their brain waves to mu move a cursor and to move a, a wheelchair in the case of people who are tetraplegic or move a robotic arm to feed them, which now in the new versioning of these technologies has become playing video games against each other or actually making, um, of interacting with artificial reality through your brain waves. This is all real. It's not, not science fiction anymore. It's real. And why is it so difficult to think that in 20 years the opposite can happen? That an external machinic intelligence can direct those brain waves and direct those thoughts and that there will be this possibility of a neural subsumption, a neural subsumption. So then, early cognitive capitalism was written about by a number of different Italian uh, post-operismo philosophers like Franco Barardi and like um, people like uh, um, Silvia Federici, uh, the great feminist who understood the importance of women's work and understood that women should be paid for their labor. And uh, um, I said Franco Barardi and um, Maurizio Lazzarato, just to name a few. And they, they came up with this idea. They understood the relationship that Fordism which it, with its linear uh, analog type of uh, machinic intelligence along the, along the uh, uh, conveyor belt in which each individual's abstract labor is so abstracted that they could intertwine and, and intervene with each other's labor if somebody was away. Labor that was so defined, so, so abstract and had uh, under the auspices of what was called Taylorism, which was this managerial technique which made that labor so efficient. How that transcends after the 1948, um, you know, cyber, cyber, uh, cybernetics uh, book by Norbert Wiener and Shannon's communicative, uh, the books about communication, how that all changes. It takes 12 years, but in the Fiat, uh, the Fiat company headquarters, all of a sudden, this kind of post-Fordism was starting to emerge in which cybernetics uh, feed forward and feedback systems and breakdowns between the managerial and the worker class started becoming more like looping and becoming like a map or a diagram. And then, of course, you get Toyotism. And then in that fuzzy area between Fordism, post-Fordism, Toyotism emerges cognitive capitalism with that art and that labor is performative. And how many artworks have we seen in the past um, uh, you know, Venice Biennale's about this idea of precarity and performativity and labor. It's all coming out of cognitive capitalism and all, all parts of this work. So then we have this early cognitive capitalism that has to do with precarity, that work is no longer stable, you don't work at the same job your, all, your whole life, um, you're alone by, you know, alone working like an artist. It's actually the artist uh, working alone by themselves and away from the camaraderieship of the, of the Fortis factory. And then we have this idea of valorization economies in which, um, you know, that, that it's no longer about value, it's about the valorization. It's how, it's, it's about populations of people saying that this object, this object that comes that you've produced has value. Like uh, when the Horts or the Rubels mentioned that an artwork at, a muse at, a, at an art fair has value and that they're going to buy it and everybody else runs and all of a sudden it's valorized and it gains value, not because it took any more t labor time to make it, but because of communicative capitalism and public relations and all these immaterial types of labor that, that actually are the things that, 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 that um, define uh, early cognitive capitalism. Now, in late cognitive capitalism, which is what we're talking about here, the neuroplasticity of the brain becomes the focus of, of power and surveillance and subjectivation. It's the how the brain is sculpted. That variability of the brain that I mentioned that allows the brain to become, that makes the brain not a crystallized entity, as positivist neuro neurologists and neuroscientists would tell us. The fact of the matter is, is that the brain is active. It's in a process of becoming. And just as we saw with Stiegler and his ideas of epiphylogenesis, the brain uh, is an incredible, variable, and diverse entity that has the capacity to change and to become, and, and to become more than it is. And it's based on artistic and cultural practices. And it represents that that brain today is a 
is, um, is, is, is a brain that is, um, uh, that is, uh, is a post-capitalist brain. It's a post-human brain. Um, it's a, it's a brain, uh, it's a post-colonial brain because we, and it's a feminist brain rather than a patriarchal brain. It's a feminist brain. Feminist works of the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, uh, managed to uh, become, become formed and they ma manifest themselves and they interdigitate themselves in the cultural milieu and they create, they defamiliarize, defunctionalize, redistribute the sensibility in such ways that the specific attention networks are changed and therefore the distributions of sensibility, which as I said, is not only an extracranial component, but it's an intracranial component, it's, it acts to sculpt the brain. So that is to say, diverse voices in aesthetic practice play more, uh, are very important uh, for this becoming brain theory of, 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 the, of, of the statisticon. Finally, I want to talk about the brain without organs and the body without organs because they're very important for this ideas that I've been talking about, about vari the variable brain, about neural diversity, about other voices, diversion ver voices that affect, um, you know, that affect not only the uh, acoustic and oral uh, habitus, but also the visual and uh, haptic uh, environment. And brain without organs comes from uh, the body without organs. That was, um, you know, talked about in um, Deleuze, in Guattari, in, in A Thousand Plateaus, uh, but also in Anti-Oedipus. And um, uh, it, it comes from actually Anton, Anton Artaud's. Artaud talked about the body that didn't have a plan, that doesn't have a master, that the plan could, that the body could become anything. And, and you see this with piercing and tattoo, and you see this with bodybuilders, this body, this body without organs, this body that doesn't have a plan, that can become other, other things. And the idea of the body, uh, the body um, without organs is also that the body isn't singular. And when we see, um, you know, artists making work where they're piercing and they're piercing in a group and they're performing in a group, the body is all interconnected. The body is beyond that. And the brain without organs is what I've been talking about. I've been talking about epigenesis. I've been talking about neuroplasticity. I've been talking about epiphylogenesis. I've been talking about exteriorization. I've been talking about defamiliarization. I've been talking about refunctioning. By the way, that's a F Brechtian term. I should just mention that. That's, again, from my German education. Um, these, these terms are saying that the brain doesn't have, the brain's neuroplasticity means that it isn't, it's not modular. It's not, there's not a visual cortex. Of course, there are areas that are uh, more visually oriented than others, uh, or the acoustic cortex, or the uh, attention, the part of the brain for attention, and so forth, and the language, and so forth, and so on. It's interconnected and it can change and the neuroplasticity is the agency of that body without organs. Thank you. And go ahead and spin up, please. Thank you. Defamiliarize, refunction, distribution of the sensible, distribution of the insensible, algorithms, internet of things, internet of everything, neuroplasticity, virtual reality, epigenesis. I am standing in front of my Statisticon diagram. It's a neon. And it is, the reason I'm blindfolded is that because it's a diagram, I'm arguing through this performance that it's a diagrammatic memory. It's a kind of memory that we, it's a network memory, the kind of memory that all of us are using. And that will be important when I'm talking about some of the issues of the, of the Statisticon Neon, like power, 
subject subjectification and other things that have to do with the new sovereignty, which is the iCloud, and other new technologies right on the, uh, on the, in the forefront. So to begin with, I just want to say a few I, a more uh, underlying comments about the, uh, about the neon. It's divided into a top portion and a bottom portion. Much like the large glass of Marcel Duchamp, it's a work in glass, except it's not, uh, it's not etched on glass, but it's using neon glass. And it's separated by a horizon line. Like Duchamp's stereoptic card 1917, the horizon becomes an important uh, component of the development of subjectivity and the, rep and the relationship between subjectivity and the other that Lacan uh, talks about. But in this one, in this case, I developed this, these two different layers because for the most part, the upper layer is about emancipation. It's about emancipation from the new forms of governmentality, or as Foucault called it, mentalité. And the bottom part is, are the new structures, are the new components, the new apparatuses of the new kinds of power. So the terms that were mentioned, so uh, again, I have this whole, I've memorized, and I have this whole uh, diagram in my mind's eye. And it's important to understand that as we move into cognitive capitalism, especially late cognitive capitalism, where neuropower replaces biopower, it's very important to understand that the mind's eye, rather than the archive, is the point at which the process of subjectification occurs. Because in cognitive capitalism, um, we are um, constantly uh, creating imaginary uh, narratives what are called scenario visualizations in our mind's eye. And instead of the archive of the photographic uh, library or the, uh, the library in general where uh, important artifacts are curated, so to speak, the mind's eye is the place of curation. And we'll t I'll tell you a little bit about that a little bit more because, because uh, the, the terms that were just mentioned have a lot to do with how that curation occurs. So the terms that were mentioned were defamiliarization, defunctioning. Um, these are terms uh, that have to do with the way the DOS, or distribution of sensibility, the distribution of insibility, or the redistribution of sensibility, how to, to refunction or to destabilize those distributions of sensibility, which as, as uh, Jean Rancière has, uh, has informed us, have to do with the creation of a, a people by policing sensibility. Now when I talk a little bit more, I'm going to talk about new kinds of technologies like brain-computer interfaces, which are just on the horizon, which will make this, will, will bypass sensibility. The, these new brain-computer interfaces with what's called a synthetic connectome, rather than the connectome which is normally used today, which means all of the connections in the material brain in the future, the, the distribution of the sensible, the distribution of the insensible, will no longer be, will be as important because there will be this post-phenomenological moment, this post-existential moment in which these new kinds of uh, technologies like brain-computer interfaces connected to, the interfa connected to the internet, connected to algorithms, connected to um, the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things, which I'll explain in a little bit, form when the brain is the central component of this, we call, uh, creates the statisticon. And I will explain that a little bit more. So we have, on the top, we mentioned it's these green arrows and mixed with red arrows because there's this whole idea of green representing emancipation. And on the bottom, for the most part, except for the central uh, core, we also have mostly red arrows and red, red, um, red elements. Now, what's important here is that every element in the diagram is connected to every other element. It may take its time. It may not be a direct connection. And, and just like in the internet, there are certain nodes that are highly visited, that are highly um, uh, you know, exchanged with. 
this, this map, this diagram, has also areas in which many different kinds of, of meaning and uh, many kinds of connections occur. So the distribution is not equal. It's, it's very uneven. And this creates all kinds of uh, different kinds of emergence, zones of irregularity, zones far from equilibrium, where uh, different kinds of things that mix, uh, mix in ways that are greater than their component parts. I might add that, um, that key to uh, the terms that were just, uh, uh, were just enunciated are the idea of artificial intelligence and where we, where we will go with artificial intelligence and how multiplicities of artificial intelligence will determine what is called the singularity, the point at which the machinic brain overwhelms the, the human brain. And we are uh, in a position, and this is another key component of the diagram, and the key component of why it's important that we have noise, why we have duende, why we have um, collage, why we have all these aesthetic and artistic methodologies that, that refunction, refamiliarize, create a redistribution of the sensibility. The importance of these is to de-optimize the, the a series of networks and the accumulation of networks that are going to be in the future networks that will be organized by artificial intelligence and the singularity. And we want to de-optimize those. So we have to be cognizant of creating a de-optimized uh, artific uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, that's one of the keys of the, um, of the diagram. The other concept that's super important to understand in relationship to this diagram is that the brain, this brain that I've been mentioning, is an intracranial brain. It, it occurs inside the cranium, the skull that surrounds the brain, and it's also extracranial. So the intracranial brain, and it's a continuum, it's not something that's one or the other. It's, 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 it's not a, a dialectic, it's, it's a continuum, and I'll explain that in a minute. But basically, yes, we have the intracranial brain, the brain of the neurons, the axons, the material brain. Not only the materiality, but their processes. Their processes, things like binding, reentry. These are, these are aspects uh, that allow the neuroplasticity, the architecture of the brain to be formed. And then we have the intracranial, the extracranial brain. And by the way, intervening between the extracranial brain and the, and the extracranial brain, the intracranial, extracranial, is a, a situated body, a body that is move, it moves and moves this whole apparatus around and, and, and uh, helps these other mechanisms take, play a role. And then on the extracranial brain, we have all the so social, new social, social movements. We have all the new technologies, one of which I want to mention is this brain-computer interface, which I'm going to go into a little bit more. We have, um, we have the, these tech, all, all the techniques, and we have uh, culture, new kinds of objects that are made by artistic interventions. And the key here, the key here to understand is that human beings, there is, there is uh, nothing like an extended phenotype, uh, this, this terminology that has to do with the body that informs itself through the, through the environment that it finds itself in. So for instance, the phylogenesis, the, phylo, the phylum of the elephant, the way it looks, not its genotype, but its phenotype, the way it looks, is already counting on a certain kind of environmental ecosystem in which it can then adapt itself very equally, meaning that the trees that it feeds with its trunk the kinds of things that it, the kinds of interactions that it has with other elephant conspecifics, all these things are already predetermined. They're not in the genome, but the world is ready for it. Now, the difference between human beings and animal forms, and their connections are, I'm not going to talk about the millions of connections and how we are connected to the animal world, that's not for this lecture, but the fact of the matter is, is that human beings live in worlds of contingency and unpredictability. And the reason for that is they don't have this kind of 
phylogenetic epigenetics like that. They don't have that. They have, their brains are full of uncertainty as well. The brain is highly variable, and on the right side, I don't know what I'm even pointing to, but I imagine in the right-handed right -handed quarter, you see nature and variability. And the variable nervous system is, is, um, is variable because it adapts to the variation in the, in the world. And I'll leave it there for now. Nature, variation, shamanism, psychedelic drugs, society of control, disciplinary society, statisticon, synopticon, panopticon. Well, we, you know, we've talked about a lot of things today, and uh, we never really uh, got to the, you know, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, uh, of the of, of the diagram, which of course is the statisticon. And as I said before, uh, maybe I, I, uh, just to reiterate it, on the top of the of of, of the diagram, uh, there are running along green and red arrows. And then on the bottom, it's mostly red, except for where the body of without organs and all of that is going on. But most of the top of the, of the diagram is, is, is about green neon, which means emancipation, and red neon, which means sub subjectification. Before I go into statisticon, I want to talk about neural capitalism, which was one of the other words that were, were mentioned. We are moving today from an information society to an one which is neural based. And just as industrial capitalism subsumed agricultural capitalism and uh, cognitive capitalism subsumed industrial capitalism, neural capitalism is subsuming this uh, digi digitality. Right now, we are on the precipice to this idea of neural capitalism. It isn't really here yet. We have, as I mentioned, the brain computer interface companies like uh, Neuralink. We have already, neural, it, when, when brain computer interfaces began, uh, they started uh, with patients that were tetraplegic, who couldn't move any part of their body, and then an electrode the tide of a, size of an aspirin was inserted into their material brain, and then through practice they learned how to use uh, a specific type of brainwave, and then using that brainwave they were able to then transduce, the brainwave was transduced uh, by a computer to be able to do certain functions on a screen, and then that those functions were then trans, uh, you know, transmitted to a robotic arm or a wheelchair and whatever. And then what happened is, is that uh, a, a number of companies started making uh, these, these uh, devices, you know, brain-computer interfaces that would, were extra or on the outside of the cranium. And um, they were um, you, from anywhere from like $600 to $60,000. And depending on how good they were, um, they, they picked up certain densities information. Well, that's one kind of technology that's very important for the future. But there are things like cortical implants, which are being used uh, for blind people, like Geordi uh, on Star Trek. Uh, those kinds of technologies are also uh, coming on. They're called techniques or neural techniques or neuroceuticals or whatever, but they're coming on. There's something called neural lace um, and um, 
This is a, a kind of a, a neural, um, it's like lace, it's like lace. And, and then you can attach uh, different kinds of, of devices uh, to, to the neural lace. And what you're basically doing is you're creating through the brain computer interfaces, the cortical implants and the neural lace, you're creating a, a kind of inter, uh, intercessional uh, neurobiological element that intercedes between the material brain and that extracranial brain that I was talking about. There's, there's a new form of, 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 of technologies that are interceding and, and, and coming back. Now, of course, ostensibly, they have this fabulous ability to help people and to cure people. And they're all getting funded uh, for that. But they're getting funded by DARPA. And DARPA is a military agency because these devices are already being used on the battlefield. It's hard to believe, but they are. They are already improving the attention uh, of, um, of people who are operating drones. They are also trying to develop non-talking communication, which is much faster. You see, the whole thing about when, you know, the whole reason why these kinds of new technologies are coming is because talking and typing is too slow. And Facebook, uh, in its building eight, uh, in its building eight uh, technologies, is developing uh, special um, devices that will allow you to think, uh, and it will be connected to a machine that will, you know, will, will type out 100 words per minute, believe it or not. 100 words per minute. If you want to look that up on the internet, you can, but it's true. It sounds impossible, but it's true. These technologies are all already with us. They're already part of it. Neural capitalism, of course, you know about uh, drugs that improve attention and improve intelligence. They're all around. We're seeing a lot of new kinds of drugs. Uh, we're, seeing, um, we're seeing things like what's called neural consumerism and neuroeconomics, all geared towards a kind of neoliberal uh, neurocapitalism or neoliberal uh, neurocognitive capitalism in which this idea of optimizing the individual, optimizing the brain, uh, improving yourself um, through these kinds of drugs and these kinds of apparatuses is playing a part. So the neoliberalism has a big role to be played here. And neural Consumerism and neural economics are device are are huge. If if you go on in, uh, on Google and you look this word up, you, maybe you haven't heard of neural capitalism, neural consumerism, or or neur neural economics. You'll find thousands of pages. There's so much research, and it's connecting the neuroscientific community, the positivist neuro uh, 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 scientific community who are being funded. By these, uh, by, this by these corporations and by the military to, uh, to create the better cognitariat, the better worker on the internet, the, the more efficient cognitariat. So as we had Taylorism in Fordism, as we mentioned, the idea of abstract labor, the idea of perfecting that abstract labor, increasing surplus value, this issue of surplus value, that their work would create more money than their labor and the machine itself was, was costing and that, that extra uh, value was what you're going for. Now we have another term which I invented called Hebian, Hebanism and Hebanism is a term from, uh, taken from the famous neuropsychologist from Canada, D.O. Heb, and has to do with the improving of the efficiency of neural networks. And I'm using that word to kind of understand how through the process of neural consumerism and neural economics that there's a kind of increased efficiency for cognitive labor. It's not here yet. I'm not, I'm speculating. It's a little bit science fiction. I understand it. But all of, all of the pawns are there. All of the pawns are there. Everything is set up. It's just a matter of time to continue. And as we know, we live in, uh, in the science fiction of 50 years ago. And in 20 years ago, many of the things that I'm saying will become true. So when we're talking about the upper and the bottom, and we're talking about neural capitalism, neural capitalism is embedded. You see that it's really close to the statisticon. Well, um, many uh, very interesting theorists, like Shoshana Zuboff at, um, at Harvard, is talking about the relationship of big data surveillance and what she calls the big other. 
that all the data that we are cognitarians, we are cognitive workers, and what do we do? We like and dislike things on Facebook. We, we search for things on the internet. We, we, uh, we go on vacations and we use uh, booking.com. And as a result, we create this incredible, uh, uh, incredible um, you know, profile, uh, individual profile of our likes and dislikes, which allows these companies to say to me on Amazon when I'm looking on Amazon, oh, Warren, do you know about this book? You might be interested in it, even before I want it. They're already calculating my needs and my desires. We, we are losing our future. Our future is being decided on, for us. And that's what, these, that's what these big data, and big the Statisticon, as you might imagine, it coming from the work statistics, is this kind of combination from the internet of everything, the, which is all data produced, where everything in your environment is connected uh, through various me methodologies. Um, artificial intelligence that relates to the singularity and has to do very, in, very uh, importantly, very close to what's called artificial neural networks, which are part, which were based on the, the, how neural networks work and were part of the original Macy conference that led from cybernetics uh, uh, into uh, this, uh, this cognitive capitalism, this, ish, this, this, this uh, continuum between the neural network of the brain and then creating these artificial neural networks that then become machinic. And it's interesting because, I want to mention that, because what's really interesting is um, uh, the, uh, the work of Rez Nagastrani in this respect, and he came to the Sospe Summer Institute of Art, the school that I uh, founded and I'm a director, and he was talking about this augmented intelligence that, that, he, that he was the first one I heard talk about it, but it's really interesting because recently there had been a, Go, a, a big Go tournament between AlphaGo, which is a new kind of computer that played Go against this Korean, uh, Korean number one player of Go. Go is much more complicated than chess. It's like 10 times more moves and more possibilities. And there's this guy named Sedol who's the number one, he's the grand master, and he lost five to th uh, three, out of two, three out of five to the computer. And what was interesting, and I mentioned this because I think it's fascinating, was that the, 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 the commentators on the game, because it was televised and there were commentators and blah, 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 they didn't understand the moves of AlphaGo. And they thought they were bad moves. And they were like, they, they were confounded by the decisions. Because the AlphaGo was learning from itself. It was a machinic intelligence. It was teaching itself as it went. And no longer needed to be guided by human intelligence. And as such, it developed an intelligence that was alien. Alien to these announcers and commentators. They had no idea what it was doing. Now you can imagine if you have this alien kind of machinic intelligence of the singularity or of a multiplicity of, alpha, of AI that are working together, they're feeding in to a, uh, a brain computer interface. And this brain computer interface, and we already know this is already happening beyond just being uh, a way to communicate uh, from the brain waves uh, to some kind of technology. They already are knowing and they're already doing research on how brain computer interfaces can stimulate neuroplasticity and change the brain. So if you now you take this and you've got to go another 20 years, you have understanding that these brain computer interfaces and this machinic, uh, linked up to machinic intelligence could actually sculpt the neuroplasticity and form our subjectivity. This is a fear. This is a reality. This is a reality. There's already, I can, if anybody wants to email me, I will give them the papers. I will tell you the papers. So like, just like a CNC mis machine that architects use to, to, to build uh, objects these days, or um, a 3D printer, this, this could be a way of looking at the way that the brain is being sculpted. Now, a little bit more, and that is this. We talked about the intracranial brain and the extracranial brain. We talked about it being a continuum. And then we get up to these green lines, or these emancipatory lines, and we see in those, we see this idea of psychedelic and shamanism, and we see variability, and we see nature. We see these, and they're feeding into neurocapitalism, and they're delinking neurocapitalism. They are the dissensus. They are the resistance. And this whole map is about resistance and dissensus. It's, I am not embracing this. I hope you understand that. I am critiquing it. I am critiquing it because neuroscientists are not. 
they are, you know, in all their goodwill uh, and, it, and, and attempt to be uh, proper citizens, they are, they are um, leading us down the path of, of a kind of uh, surveillance and subjectivity that we should all fear and raise, an, uh, and, uh, and raise alarms to. And I'm arguing that there are many, uh, we have to think about already ways of, of, uh, of, of creating resistances to these. One of these is to make my artistic work and to do these performances, let people know. But also it's about the way that psychedelic drugs, which are also neuroplastic, they do change the neuroplasticity of the brain. And um, they have the capacity to shut down certain parts of the brain. It's not just having a psychedelic experience, like when, with ayahuasca, ayahuasca is working at the neural synaptic junction of the material brain, of the intracranial brain, but it's also causing changes in the sensations and sensibility, which we are then uh, people uh, throughout the history of, this, of, of the South Americans have been using to make uh, in their religious experiences to make religious forms of art and drawings and, and different kinds of apparatuses that allow them to venture into the world of ayahuasca. So the ayahuasca is not only an intracranial uh, manifestation uh, of, the neural, of the neural synaptic junction, but it's also something that's happening in the extracranial brain. It become, they become artistic technologies that, that function within religious ceremonies. Yeah? So there is that. Then there's shamanism. Shamanism is, or shamans are an important uh, individual within uh, many uh, tribal cultures. Not, and actually, uh, shamanism is not only in the southern hemispheres, but actually shamanism is, a, is, is something that happened in Russia. And, and there are many shamans uh, and spiritual leaders who allow people who, during, through intricate uh, ceremonies and rituals, can enter into the other side. The other, and sometimes ayahuasca is actually used and drugs are used to enter into the other side. And entering into the other side and bringing that other side back into, into, into our reality is a way of disrupting those uh, networks that we uh, depend on. And so all of these things are coming down and they are possible ways that we can dissent and create resistances to neural capitalism and the statisticon. One other thing is that the Statisticon is one form, is, an, is the latest form in a phylogeny of different forms of governmentalization and subjectification. We know, and, and has a lot to do with what I was talking about, biopower, biopolitics, and neuropower. So what happens in, in uh, in the disciplinary society, which is on the far right side, the far left side, my right, your left, is that what Foucault understands in the seventh, 17th century about biopolitics and about biopower is that it goes through a radical shift. No longer do, uh, does the monarchy or forms of government have a, have a, are interested in this idea of to take a life or not to take a life. That no longer becomes important. What becomes important in biopolitics and these new forms of governmentalization called the disciplinary society is to improve life, to improve life, to improve it, to make, to, to better, to make the body uh, more resistant. And using the model of the panopticon, Jeremy Bentham's uh, model for how a surveillance within a penitentiary system could be um, could be used uh, in those systems. Foucault uh, takes that idea and moves it into an idea of the disciplinary society and understands the idea of the footprint, the architectural footprint made of walls to, that can seclude and sequester. We, in a way, right now, uh, we are living in a disciplinary society. Of course, it's a very different disciplinary society than the one Foucault talked about and was very different than the plague uh, the, that was used to um, create uh, infectious disease wards uh, or, and, and mental hospitals that Foucault talked about. But we are, right now, we are being secluded because of the pandemic and that, in a way, goes, follow, goes all the way back to the disciplinary society. Now, what happened was, even at the end of Foucault's life, 
he understood that with the internet and the coming of, the, of, of this new cybernetic uh, world, that those boundaries, those, those enclosures would no longer be up to the task. That when we lived in a world of the internet and we lived in a world of codes, and that we were going to enter into what was called the society of control. And this was, was something where, uh, where everything, uh, everything could become, we could be monitored from everywhere. And this idea of surveillance was om, uh, um, omnipresent and uh, we couldn't escape it. What happens with the Statisticon is that now data, our choices, uh, we move from, yes, we can, again, it's still, you have to understand, subsumption. Disciplinary society is subsumed by the society of control, which is, which is subsumed by the statisticon. It's not that the, that the disciplinary society has gone away. I already mentioned, we're in the pandemic. It's not that we don't use passwords to get into our computer programs. It's not that we don't use uh, credit cards to, to pay for our goods. We don't, it's not that we don't use passwords to get into, go through doorways, uh, or, or, or even I, uh, now we can even use our retina images to do so. It's not that those are gone away, right? They're still here. But now we have another type of surveillance, the surveillance that we as good cognitariates utilizing our free will to use the internet are, are giving away all our freedoms and smiling about it and enjoying it. And that is the Statisticon. Statisticon represents the latest manifestation of a phylogeny of techniques, the phylogeny of techniques. We now know, and what makes the Statisticon different, it's not that, again, it's not that their disciplinary society, society and control didn't affect the neuroplasticity of the brain. But now, the neuroplasticity of the brain through the epigen epiphylogenesis of new technologies is being on purpose sculpted. It's being with, we, the people in DARPA know about it. And, and they are creating technologies with the idea of this sculpting. And people already like neural, people like uh, uh, Musk, if you, if you hear him, he's already talking about, let's not, he, and you can find this on the internet, let's not just use brain computer interfaces for tetraplegic people. Let's allow, let's make them and find uses for everyone. For everyone. Let's use neural, let's use these technologies and have everybody affected. And that's where I'm going to end it.